All right. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? Can yeah, yes. hear me? Welcome, everybody, to Imaging One World. This is um, a proper summer edition. I hope everybody is enjoying the lovely, beautiful weather. And we have Martin Booth from Oxford today speaking, and um, Nick Barry is going to introduce him. And then I hope you will enjoy, as always, our lovely scientific exploration of imaging and discussions. We don't have a Mentimeter today, but um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat so we can actually pick them up and we can have a nice, lively question and answer discussion after the talk. I think Martin's talk is about 30, 40 minutes, and then we should have plenty of time to, to pick up on questions. If you have a multiple choice question, you can put that also in the, in the chat as well. Martin is specifically asking, since we don't have Mentimeter, if you want to have a quick, difficult multiple choice question for Martin, he might appreciate it. So challenge us. Over to Nick now. Okay, it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Martin Booth from uh, Oxford University. Martin, um, I think you are just an Oxford man through and through. I think you just mentioned you were there as an undergraduate, stayed and did your PhD with Tony Wilson. In um, again in optics, and then um, you went on to form your own group. So, you've just been working on adaptive optics really at the front, at the leading edge of this, this field for, for a long, long time. And I think if you are interested in this field, you almost certainly will have heard of his work. And certainly, Martin is probably the sort of go to collaborator if you want to really find out the detail the uh, ins and outs of this um, subject. Martin's the um, Professor of Engineering and Science and Associate in the Department of Engineering and Engineering Science at Oxford University and also leader, in, leader of the group of op Dynamic Optics and Photonics in that department. Martin's work on adaptive optics has really gone from the very basics um, into things like two photon adaptive optics, stead adaptive optics, adapted optics in uh, fluctuation correlation spectroscopy, in four pi microscopy, in super resolution microscopy, in cryo microscopy, you name it. it Martin has sort of put his stamp on uh, this field. Martin was recently um, elected as to fellowships with the SBIE and the IOP in recognition of his contributions over many years to this field and um, is also, I think, a director of the Aurox company, which um, um, is a selling laser free uh, confocal microscopes. Um, I think at that, I will hand over to Martin and uh, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say on this subject. Thank you so much for agreeing to be our speaker for this week. Great, thank you very much. Let me get my screen sorted out and then we can get going. So hopefully that's looking okay. Is it okay? All good. Can you see my screen? Yes, all good. Great, thank you. Okay. Yeah, great. So the um, yeah the talk I'll be giving today, obviously subject some adaptive optics for microscopes. But I thought I'd give a slightly different talk um, in this forum, um, where I'll explain a little bit of my take on the um, the history of this subject and where we've got to at the moment and what's needed for the for the future. Um, and it will be, in doing this, I'll present some of our research results, but also some examples of other people's work in this area as well. Um, now, I'll just, just warn people that uh, this will not be a complete history. It's not meant to be a complete history or even a complete snapshot of what's going on at the moment. In the interest of time, I've just picked out a few points of interest. And so I do apologise to anybody if they think I've uh, highlighted somebody else's work instead of their, their own. But um, I explain this is for illustration purposes rather than for completeness. So very quickly, let me just go through the background to this uh, before we move on to the main part of the talk. And of course, the problems are that in microscopes, we have optical elements and specimens in there which are not perfect. Optical elements, the objective lenses, uh, we try to make them as perfect as possible, but they always have some aberrations in them. Specimens, unfortunately, when we try to focus through them, the refractive index structures of the specimens cause us problems and introduce aberrations. So if we try to focus, for example, a laser beam through these, then we would end up with an aberrated focus, which leads to loss of resolution and a decrease in image quality and contrast. 
These aberrations can arise from numerous sources, but the most common one is probably refractive index mismatch. And this is, for example, exists between a uh, cover glass and the emotion medium or the, or the cover glass and the mountain medium. And um, these aberrations depend upon the depth of focusing, the numerical aperture and the magnitude of the refractive index mismatch. And the idea here is that is if we tried to focus our laser beam down, we looked at the focal spot, then if we focus through, um, through a, an interface, the refraction at the surface causes the rays no longer to meet up and causes the, um, the focal spot to be uh, distorted and particularly elongated along the optical axis, as you can see in this particular diagram here. And this is the reason why we have lower contrast and resolution in these microscopes. Um, but the problem is much more complicated than just this planar refractive <laughs> index mismatch, for example, at the cover slip, because the specimen below the cover slip tends to have its own refractive index structure. And to take an example from some time ago here, where we, where we actually measured this directly in the C. elegans, and we went to focus at different points in the specimen and measured the phase in the pupil of the objective lens. And this is what we saw. As we focused to different positions, you can see that the aberrations change. We get significant phase variations. And if we focus to different parts of the specimen, we see different phase variations. So this is why we need an adaptive method of compensating for aberrations in order to maintain the quality of operation of the microscope. And so in principle, what we do is we would, uh, if we're using a laser scanning microscope, we could think about pre-aberrating a wavefront so that when it passes through the optical system, including the specimen, that the aberration we introduce with the adaptive element compensates for that and cancels out that introduced by the, the system and the specimen. So we end up again with our diffraction limited focus and our improved resolution and contrast. Now this is just, this diagram here just shows one particular aspect of focusing a laser beam into a specimen. But as you all know, microscopes tend to be more complicated than that in general. We have image, just for example, we have imaging microscopes where we need to get uh, not just image light from a point, but from a whole image field onto a camera. Or we have scanning microscopes where we need to uh, scan the spot around. And in both cases, we don't just need to worry about light getting into the specimen, but light getting back out again. And aberrations can affect us in both directions. So we need to think about much more complex optical systems here than just a simple one-way um, system with an aberrated beam on the way in. We often have to think about aberrated beams on the way in, on the way out, and whether we're doing image fields or point-like um, scanning, we will have different adaptive optics problems to deal with. But in general, what we can do in most situations is we can take a system like this, where we place an adaptive element in the illumination path in order to create that pre-aberrated wavefront I just mentioned. But we can also use a similar element, perhaps the same element in many situations in the outgoing path, so that the focal emission which passes through the specimen and becomes aberrated can then be corrected by the adaptive element. And so um, we, we can think of this, we can see now how aberration correction in microscopes starts to get complicated when we have microscopes which require dual path correction. Um, typically though we can, we, can, we can do this if we choose the appropriate adaptive element. Um, whether or not we need to correct in both paths depends upon the type of the microscope. And this will be come further into my story later, the point that um, we have different types of microscopes and different types of microscopes may require different solutions for adaptive optics. How do we actually do the correction? We, we, what is this adaptive element? Well, we, can, we usually use one of two, um, two methods. The first method was a deformable mirror which is, as, as its name suggests, a reflective um, surface whose shape we can change. And um, the shape is changed by the application of forces using an actuator structure. And by applying forces to this, this, uh, this mirror surface, which could be a membrane, for example, then we will be able to change its shape. And by changing its shape, we'll be able to change the way in which it adds or removes phase variations from the beam, which is reflected off it. Um, deformable mirrors are useful in microscopes because they are um, polarization insensitive and they are, have broadband operation. So they're very useful in microscopes where you have multiple channels, where you have fluorescence, which is of course unpolarized and broadband and so on, which is why we often use them. However, we also use liquid crystal spatial light modulators, um, which work on a different principle, of course. 
because we in here we use the uh, we, we use the uh, electrodes to change the state of the liquid crystal materials so that they uh, effectively exhibit a different refractive index so that now when the light reflects off it due to the change in the refractive index at each of the pixels we can control the spatial pattern of the phase of the light reflected off the spatial light modulator. Now these tend to be best used in um, laser illumination paths because they, they require polarized light um, for operation and they're also because of the way we have to use them they tend to be uh, have chromatic more chromatic effects but that still means they're very well suited to laser illumination paths and so we often use them there and in certain microscopes they're, they're, that's all, all we need to do so for example a two photon microscope where we only need to think about how the quality of the light on the way into the microscope we could use a spatial light modulator for that and they are very commonly used so that's my very brief introduction of the principles behind the adaptive optics in microscopes. But as I said, the first part of my talk was really, I wanted to very quickly go over some of the history of this to put it in context. And you'll see from my little um, sub notes there, that this will be an incomplete and highly selective history for the reasons I explained before. So uh, please don't assume it's, uh, it's complete. And I uh, don't be offended if I've not included your, uh, your favorite um, uh, method. So, Dealing with the problem of aberrations. Now, in a way, there's, there's three ways we can look at this. And for the first way, I'm going to go all the way back to uh, Isaac Newton. Um, because while Newton, well, Newton uh, dealt with um, um, imaging microscopy, really, this, the, the illustration I want to show you here is Newton describing in, in, his, um, in his book, Optics, about um, his telescopes. Because he realized that um, telescope imaging was affected by tremors in the atmosphere, as it's referred to here. And as he said in the last sentence here, the only remedy is a most serene and quiet air, such as may perhaps be found on the tops of the highest mountains above the grosser clouds. Now, what Newton's suggesting here is that if you've got aberrations in your system, it's best to try and avoid them. That's why I've termed this evasive optics. Just, just try and try not to have this problem in the first place. And of course, this is what we've mostly done in microscopy and should probably continue to do, which is try and find ways of doing imaging where we don't suffer from aberrations. So for example, if you can mount your specimens in the correct mountain medium so we don't suffer from aberrations, then do that. If you can have a correction collar and set it to the best setting, then do that. Um, I, I, one of the first things I always say to people when they ask about using adaptive optics, first thing I do is try to convince them that they don't need adaptive optics because that's by far the easiest way to approach this problem. So that's one way of dealing with the problem of aberrations as proposed by Newton. The next one I'd say is uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's or Hux approach, because both, um, both of them developed microscopes and um, developed them well. They made the optics well in order to get the best imaging. Um, you know, Van Leeuwenhoek's um, success here is allegedly due to the fact he could make these ball lenses far better than anybody else could. And um, that's still the best way to do it. You know, if you can get a good objective lens and you can, you can use optical engineering to avoid aberrations, it's definitely the way to go. So again, don't use adaptive optics unless you need to. Now, the uh, actual adaptive optics approach was first proposed, at least in the area of uh, telescopes, astronomical telescopes by um, Horace Babcock, who um, in this particular paper here in 1953, proposed how one might deal with this problem. Now, of course, in astronomy, you're dealing with the, um, the, the problem which Newton was mentioning above, the variations of the refractive index in the atmosphere due to turbulence. And um, Babcock's idea was that we could, it's basically, a, basically an idea for a de first deformable mirror, so, uh, but it was based around an oil film. He said, well, if we have an oil film and we can use electrostatic forces to change the shape of the oil film, then we can reflect the light off that oil film and you do the correction. So this was how Bag Babcock had originally proposed to do this. Now, this was some time before this was actually implemented, but the idea, this was probably the first time that that idea was, was actually proposed in astronomy. Now, you're probably aware that adaptive optics were originally used in telescopes. Um, Certainly astronomy is the one most one you come across, but it's very certainly also in the military. The military spent a lot of money on adaptive optics. Um, the US military, of course, mostly. Um, but the principle is that you, you know, in all of these cases that you measure the wavefront distortion using a wavefront sensor, and then you uh, use that information to, to control a correction element, which would then remove the distortions and give you images. And this is now widely used in, in astronomy. 
um, to the extent that people just assume it's on and it's working, in, in, in at least on the simpler telescopes now. <coughs> so um, you might think, well, okay, if this is working so well in astronomy, isn't that easy then? We just take the astronomy solution and we put it into microscopes. But it turns out that's not so easy to do because um, there are other challenges in microscopes which were not present in uh, telescopes. One simple thing is that in the telescopes, this is a this is a one-way system. You've got light coming from a distant object into your telescope and it's aberrated on the way and you have to correct that aberration. But as we discussed before, microscopes tend to actually have more complex optical systems. You have illumination paths, you have detection paths, sometimes you have multiple laser beams or multiple detection paths. And so we actually have much more complex optical systems. And this solution here, which is shown in this slide, does not necessarily translate well. And only in a few cases does it translate well into, into this. So if we then look back at well, where did it start? Where did we start seeing adaptive optical microscopes? Well, the first example I know of, and I'd be happy if anyone else shows me anything before this, well, the first example I know of was here in this SPIE proceedings from 1992. Uh, where John O'Byrne and Carol Cogswell in Sydney had proposed this idea here. And you can see in the diagram, they have a deformable mirror in a, in a uh, at least in the diagram, in a reflection mode microscope, where they could use this to, um, use this to, the principle was they'd be able to detect and correct for the compensate for these aberrations introduced by the uh, specimens. Now, uh, the concept is there. The, the results were rather preliminary in this paper. And uh, you, know, you can see, for example, the picture on the right shows an aberrated points wave function that doesn't show it uh, being corrected. But this is the first example I saw of somebody suggesting this in microscopes. And then time went on and then a few people started working on it. When I started doing my, uh, my uh, PhD here in Oxford, the work of that was actually in developing the first functioning version of this for a confocal microscope. And that's where we led on to this work, in, which was published in 2002, where we were able to do three-dimensional confocal imaging in uh, fluorescently labelled um, prepared slides. And you can see here clearly on the image on the right that we've been able to increase the contrast and resolution of these images. You'll notice the optical axis on these goes top to bottom and the biggest effect, the strongest effect you have in the correction is along that direction. Because of the, uh, what I showed you before is that the aberrations, the primary effect of aberrations in these microscopes is to elongate the focal spot more than broaden it. So if you're looking at thin specimens, the aberrations don't necessarily look severe, but when you start looking at thicker specimens, especially looking at axial sections, then this looks, um, this looks more effective. We also did some early work as well on um, uh, aberration correction for, in this case, uh, multi-layer optical data storage, which, you know, CD players and so on, they're effectively confocal microscopes. And so this was also another area outside of bioimaging where we were able to implement this. But this was then taken further. We applied it to diff many different types of microscopes. Here's an example here from our work on using two photon fluorescence microscopy for looking at uh, mouse embryos. And you can see clearly here, even at this scale, focusing through about 100, approximately 100 microns depth of the mouse embryo, you can see that the aberration corrected version on the right is much brighter and uh, clearer. And if you zoom in further into these regions here, then you can see much more clearly as I flick between the two, the difference in resolution and contrast, even in these raw images coming out of the microscope. This was taken further. We applied this to other types of microscope. This is a, again, a multi-photon non-linear microscope, but this time with third harmonic instead of fluorescence. And again, in a mouse embryo, we were able to show that we could get considerably improved resolution using the adaptive optics to correct for the uh, specimen-induced aberrations. Now, the, I've only shown you a few of the many examples I could show you here of where we've implemented this. Um, all of these methods we, we used were based around what we called image-based or wavefront sensorless adaptive optics. In other words, we didn't use the wavefront sensor, which was, um, which was um, employed in, for example, the astronomical systems. And the reason being that it's very difficult to use that in some of these microscopes. Although I will show you very shortly examples where you can use it and use it effectively. The method we use, this image-based uh, wavefront sensorless adaptive optics, involves applying uh, a sequence of chosen aberrations, carefully chosen aberrations, to take a sequence of small sequence of images from which we can infer what the aberration correction should be. And the whole idea here is that we know how the aberrations, how the microscope images are affected by aberrations. So if we choose carefully and use our mathematical models of the microscope and choose carefully the aberrated images we take, we can use that information to infer where the optimum um, 
imaging quality would be. And we do that by calculating image quality metrics and using our mathematical models to allow us to efficiently estimate the correction phase. In. And we do this for all of the different aberration modes which may be present, including spherical aberration, coma, astigmatism, and so on. Um, this, there's various different ways we can approach this. Um, it usually means that we, we can do this kind of correction in the matter of, you know, it would be, wouldn't be unusual to do it in 20 or 30 images. And 20 or 30 images we can take pretty quickly. So if we optimize these things for speed, we can typically do them within, you know, one or two seconds if we, need, if we needed to. Although as aberrations in microscopes tend to be relatively static for a particular imaging task, they may change if you move to different parts of your specimen or to different depths, but for a particular imaging task, they tend to be relatively static. So once you've corrected, that's, that correction stays the same for the rest of that particular imaging task. So we've developed these methods quite widely for a whole different range of microscopes. Um, but then uh, I mentioned the original idea from um, telescopes was that we would use um, we would use um, wavefront sensors. Now, wavefront sensors um, work well when you have, like, a, like in the telescopes, a distant point-like object. And that point-like object creates a well-defined wavefront which your wavefront sensor can measure. The problem is in microscopes, we generally have two-dimensional or three-dimensional objects, which means that we have a lot of light coming from a lot of different points, which creates all creates their own wavefronts, which then land upon the wavefront sensor. You know, if you put it simply, if you try to do this with an with a with an extended source, you'll end up with um, just a swamped away from sensors swamped with light and no useful measurements. So the wavefront sensors always need some way to exclude out of focus light. Now there is one way you can use these and quite use them quite effectively in microscopes, and that's for example if you have a point object and you know it's a point object like a bead. It's not very practical to put beads into specimens for this purpose usually, but if you use a two photon excitation then you know that you're only going to get fluorescence from the focal spot. So in effect, you have your point-like object as your guide star, as you would You're like a guide star in telescopes, and a guide star in microscopes. And this was the basis of quite a, a few uh, implementations of uh, wavefront sensor-based adaptive optical microscopy. And I think the most effective one is this one from uh, Eric Betzig's group, where they use the two-photon excitation to create that source for a shack hartman sensor, which allowed them to then uh, do on the fly correction of, um, of aberrations. And this particular paper here from several years ago now was really very effective, uh, particularly in combination with um, deconvolution, um, which was enabled by the adaptive optics. And um, you can see just from these images I've, I've borrowed from the, <clears throat> from the paper here, that um, the adaptive optics corrections made considerable difference in this, this relatively thick uh, but transparent um, zebrafish embryo. So wavefront sensors can be, can be used in certain confined um, applications in microscopes, uh, but they're not a general solution for all types of microscopes. Uh, I've just picked out a couple of other examples just because they're kind of <clears throat> interesting and unusual, um, just to illustrate some different ways of approaching this, um, because there are other ways of doing indirect aberration measurement. So um, probing the aberrated focus through one way or another, normally through some form of focal modulation, you can use your adaptive element to change the focus, perhaps by adding aberrations or by changing some property of the focus and using information contained within the images you get to uh, infer what the aberration correction should be. Now, one example here, this is the work led by um, Naji, where what they did was they said, well, let's consider splitting the pupil up into different segments. And in each of those segments, we can apply a tip tilt or a piston type aberration and image through that segment. And if you do that, what you get is a whole sequence of images, which will be slightly shifted depending upon what the tip or tilt of the aberration was in that particular zone. And so if you take a whole sequence of measurements measured through each of these and look at the image shifts, you'd be able to work out what the, uh, what this, what the um, local wavefront tilt would be. And then from that, you'd be able to reconstruct the whole wavefront. <clears throat> and there's a few other steps involved, but that's the basic principle of it. And indeed, in later work where this was combined with full pupil illumination, then we're able, they were able to get some quite uh, impressive results focusing deep inside neural tissue. <coughs> now, another example, just as an, illust as an illustration of an unusual an un way of approaching this, <coughs> was this paper by Papadopoulos and, and colleagues. Um, which they called F sharp, but involved the principle of taking two beams, one of which was slightly was brighter than the other, and scanning them relatively to each other whilst taking an image. 
And um, the whole idea here was you take these two beams and you split them up and then you scan one relative to the other whilst taking a sequence of measurements. And um, if you look through the mathematics of this, which I won't go through, I'll just briefly throw up, where you take a weak beam and a strong beam and then you expand the mathematics out, then what you realise is that you end up with effectively a narrow probe, which is like one of the beams effectively acts like a probe, probing the other beam, which allows you to work out the complex amplitude of that beam, and hence, through a Fourier transform, the complex amplitude in the pupil. And so by having this effectively narrow probe, you're able to uh, extract the phase information and then do the correction. And this is what they were able to do. You can see the before and after images here, and the coloured one shows you the um, shows you the uh, aberration that they corrected in this case here. And um, this is a this is although it's a very different way of generating the actual data. It's a similar idea that you take a sequence of images and you can use the information in those images to infer what the aberration correction should be. And um, a, a recent you see that was a few years ago. There's a recent variation of this. I'll just point you to which. Um, which is sort of a more, slightly more advanced version of the F sharp, they call it dash, um, where in fact um, it actually increases the efficiency and accuracy in many ways of the F sharp method to make it even more, more optimal. But again, it's this idea of some form of indirect sensing, because we can't use a wave from sensor form of indirect sensing of what's actually happening inside the um, inside this uh, specimen, inside the focus, in order to work out what the aberration correction should be. So those are just a few examples, as I say, are just selective examples I pulled out to show you um, what people have done. Um, if I conclude this historical part, then um, I'd say, you know, adaptive optics has required various developments beyond the concepts used in astronomy and elsewhere. Um, it's been demonstrated in a wide range of microscopes. And while all of these demonstrations have shown the success and the poten future potential of adaptive optics, there's still no unified solution, if you like a plug and play solution, which anybody can get hold of to put in their microscopes. So my second part is the state of the art. Where are we now? What are people doing at the moment? Well, as I've already, already hinted at, this really is an important concept when thinking about adaptive optics in microscopes. There is more than one type of microscope, and this is because there is more than one type of microscope, they often have very considerably different uh, optical configurations and certainly very different image formation processes. Um, I've provided a, an incomplete list here just to illustrate you know, some of the areas where people have implemented and shown adaptive optics to be successful. But as I said, the solutions come in many forms and there's none which is yet suitable for all microscopes. And even in our case where you know, we've implemented uh, image-based adaptive optics in a whole range of what you might call conventional resolution microscopes, as shown three examples at the top of this slide, and uh, indeed lots of work we've done in the past few years on super resolution microscopes, three examples shown in the bottom of this slide here. Um, you know, with the, all of these have got slightly different implementations, although the concept, the fundamental concept of image-based aberration correction is the same, we've, we've come up with different ways of, of the actual direct implementations. So um, lots of methods exist, lots of methods are effective, um, but we don't yet have that unified method. What other things are going on? Well, there's a lot of work. All of these examples I've shown you here in this slide are basically around what you might call low order smooth aberrations, the kind of things you experience in microscope slides or focusing you know, up to a couple of hundred micrometers inside tissue. But people have, of course, been pushing adaptive optics from the other end, for which we might call scattering compensation or imaging through turbid media. And just a couple of illustrations of that. Um, what we're talking about here is very heavily scattering media. Things like could be a piece of paper, could be an eggshell, could be a, a, a could be skin tissue or thick brain tissue. Um, this tends to create much more severe phase aberrations. They're more complex and higher in amplitude and um, require, a, well, you could say it requires a slightly different solution, although in many ways the solution has good big similarities to what we've been talking to be talking about before. And um, this uh, review paper here actually refers back to some earlier work where, uh, where this was first implemented. And um, the idea being that even if the scattering, strongly scattering sample, which normally creates a speckle pattern from your laser beam, even if most of the light is, is diffused away, it is possible to optimize a small proportion of that light to create a focus. And that's what you see at the bottom here, where uh, we've been able to create a focus behind a strongly scattering um, uh, plate. And you can see that this focal spot is probably two orders of magnitude brighter than the speckle patterns surrounding it. So 
Um, although only a small amount of light is focused into that spot, it is sufficient to do imaging. And many people have done imaging of this type, and I'll just show you one example here. Uh, this is from Tanga Tal in uh, 2012, where they were imaging through, um, through a mouse skull. And you can see the uncorrected one on the right and the corrected one in the middle. And on the left, you see the phase pattern they've put onto their uh, correction element. And it's very clear that using this type of optimization procedure, again, this is an image based optimization or a signal based optimization where you're applying different test aberrations and then you're trying to optimize the signal you're getting out of it. So it is, an, although it's a different regime to what we were talking about before, it is an analogous process. And it's clear that at the end of this, you can actually get better images. Um, there's many, many more variations on this, and I've just there's a recent, relatively recent review paper I've just pointed you to at the bottom if you're interested to look at more. Um, one of the main areas in which you see adaptive optics used is deep tissue imaging, and again, I've just pulled a recent example of this out, with just a, an illustration rather than representative of everything that's going on. And in this case, this is from um, uh, Robert Prevedel's group in uh, in Embo where they've been uh, using three photon microscopy and, um, and uh, using this to image large depths, up to a millimeter inside um, brain tissue. And um, you know, similar, similar proposals here that you've optimized the signal and you can then get much more increased uh, image quality. Now three photon uh, microscopy is very, looking very promising for neural imaging because it works at a much longer wavelength the eliminations at a much longer wavelength, which means that you can penetrate further into tissue. But as it penetrates further into tissue, you suffer from more aberrations. So this is now one of the, for the forefront, if you like, of deep tissue adaptive optics. Another area in which, which there's a lot of work going on, and we're working in this area as well as many other people, is developing adaptive optics for aberration correction in super resolution microscopes. And um, although I, I showed you on the earlier slide three examples of the th three different types of microscopes we're looking at, I'm just going to show you some examples from STED microscopes. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the STED, but I will very quickly just remind you of how the principle of the microscope works, because it's important to then explain how aberrations affect the microscope. So normally instead, microscopy, we excite fluorescence using a focused laser beam. We then have a second beam a depletion beam which is shaped to have a zero intensity in the center of it and that's the key point here because that depletion beam is used to, through to use the process of stimulated emission to in effect switch off the fluorescence and once it's done that the resulting excited fluorescent molecules are confined to a much smaller region and this works because we can saturate that stimulated emission effect which means we can turn up the power of that depletion beam until we've basically saturated most of the fluorescence except for a very small region at the center and the reason why the center is not depleted is because we had a zero intensity there but that's where the key thing comes into with the aberrations and how aberrations affect these microscopes is that if the aberrations cause that zero intensity to be filled in so it's not quite zero anymore when you turn up the power of that depletion beam you start switching off the fluorescence in the center so you don't see very much at all and so that's why we we are using the adaptive optics, particularly in the depletion beam, to ensure we get that zero intensity. It's the most critical part. And we've, we're have we working with um, Jörg Baversdorf's group in, uh, in Yale. We've been working on these super resolution methods. And here's an example we published recently where we've combined that with two photon to enable us to do both deep tissue imaging and stead microscopy. And um, in this case here, you can see that the, uh, just some examples showing how we've combined two photon excitation with, uh, with with um, STED depletion in order to get 2D and three dimension, two dimensional and three dimensional enhancement. And this video here shows the results from around 200 micrometers into uh, fixed mouse brain tissue. I should say there were also results in this paper from live brain tissue as well. And you can see as we switch off the aberration correction, that's without aberration correction now, and the signals are very weak, there's not much enhancement. And if the, when the aberration correction is uh, shown again, which I'll show in a minute, then in this video, you'll see that a lot more of the details of those uh, dendrites are now revealed as they weren't before. Um, we've also applied this in um, not just for deep tissue imaging, but for cellular imaging as well, where we've combined the adaptive optics and the stead microscopy with 4Pi methods as well. So the idea in 4Pi methods is that we have, uh, rather than just taking a single objective lens with the point spread function as explained before, we now use two interferometrically combined objective lenses opposing like this in order to get a point spread function which is more confined in the z direction. So this enables greater um, 
a greater aberration, a greater fluorescence collection because you have more um, more solid angle of the objective lenses to collect the emitted fluorescence. But also we can get higher resolution by using both of these um, objectives in concert. And um, this has been combined into uh, the four pi ISO stead microscope. And here's an outline of this uh, diagram here. Now it's, uh, it's, you can see how, I'm not gonna go through every step of this clearly, but um, you can see how complex these microscopes have become. Uh, the things you will notice in here, if I point them out, are that we have the two four pi objectives here on the left-hand side. Around there, there's an almost triangular, a bit more complex, but almost triangular um, um, interference cavity. And in there, we have two deformable mirrors. And there's one of these in each path because we have different aberrations in each of those paths. And so one thing we've done is developed um, new control approaches in order to control these deformable mirrors in order to make sure they can work effectively as a unit in these four pi microscopes. There's also a spatial light modulator here, which is used to shape the, um, the depletion beam. So to create that zero intensity at the center, and it actually has two passes off the spatial light modulator, which enables us to modulate two orthogonal polarization modes in order to have two superimposed patterns and get a three-dimensional um, um, three dimensional uh, depletion pattern in the focus. So you can see this is a rather complicated system. In effect, there's four adaptive elements in it and two objective lenses, um, but I'll show you the results from this now. This is um, the conventional, if you like, convo confocal image we would have got out of this of some microtubules, but if we then switch on the stead, the four pi stead mode, then you can see that we can now resolve down at the what was it, 20, 30 nanometer level uh, in three dimensions of what's going on inside here. And also, if we look at this video here, you can see that we're all the way through the cell. You're able to resolve um, the features at this kind of resolution throughout the whole thickness of the cell. By being able to you change the aberration correction as you focus at different depths to within even this relatively thin specimen here. Okay, so those are illustrations of where we're able to push adaptive optics at the moment in microscopes. Um, so what's the uh, current status? Well, there's a few questions you might ask if you scanned around and looked at the literature. And you say, well, one thing something you know, somebody might ask is, most deep tissue adaptive optic microscope development appears to be in two photon microscopy. So why is that? Well, um, one argument for that is that there's a lot of applications in things like neuroscience and they have to, you tend to use two photon microscopes to focus deeply. So that's one of the reasons. That's certainly a reason why that is going on. This is one of the main application areas. Another reason though, I think, is that it's easier. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to get into a debate with somebody about this, this later, but uh, in a two photon microscope, all you need to do is use a spatial light modulator to modulate the light on the way in. Um, the resolution and contrast of the two photon microscope is predominantly determined by the quality of that focal spot, which is determined by the ingoing path. So um, we don't need to correct on the way out. So it's actually easier in the sense we only need to correct in one path. So I think that's one another reason why that's the case not just the uh, applications. Another question you might ask, especially if you looked at the super resolution microscopes is, well, most super resolution adaptive microscopes are actually single molecule microscopes, you know, Storm, Palm, that, that kind of um, variant. Why is that? Well, I think the reason's similar again, the, the optics is far simpler. If you look at the, you know, the, the, the diagrams I showed of the stead microscope, it's pretty complicated. But if you're doing single objective lens, single molecule microscopy, which is of course a very popular super resolution method, then, um, then the adaptive optic solutions there are simpler. So you see a pattern emerging here, which is that, um, and not surprisingly, this is certainly not any criticism of anybody, um, the reason why these are the most popular ones is because they're most accessible. It's the accessibility to the technology which makes it more attractive to people. And this is an important thing to bear in mind. A couple of other questions which might pop up. Why are there so many different methods overall? Seems a little bit strange that you know, we should have so many, such a variety. And there are only very limited AO microscope solutions are available, um, particularly if you're um, thinking about commercial solutions. Why, why, why can we not buy these? You, know, you will find a couple of companies selling modules and so on, but there's not really, you can't buy this from most minor manufacturers. They're very limited in scope. I'm gonna answer those last two questions separately while explaining my, my perception of what's actually going on here. So it's a question I'm asked a lot, is why can't we buy these commercially? What's wrong? And I think you need to analyze what's actually going on, not just scientifically, but sort of sociologically as well, as well here in the, in the whole ecosystem. 
So why are there any, so many different AO methods and why can't I buy them? That's the essence of the question. Well, we have a, we have a range here of where things might be developed. And on the left-hand side of my slide, I've got academic research. And on the right-hand side, I've got commercial product development. And these two things are very different. So let's ask the question, why would you do AO, adaptive optics in academic research, particularly if you're an optical engineer, right? Well, probably something like this. You want to get a high impact publication or you want to get promotion, or you want to write a good thesis, something like that, right? So generally what you'd want to do therefore, and it's fully understandable, is you'd want to do new and exciting methods. So you invent something new and you try to make it as impressive as possible, possibly as complicated as possible and show how clever you are, and then you do this. And that's what we've all been doing mostly in academic research for the past two decades in, in adaptive optics. Let's look at the commercial product development. Why would you do adaptive optics there? Well. You want to do it because you want to sell products and you want to make profit. And that probably means you need some form of simple, cheap and effective solution. And more than that, you probably want something that once you've, in, once you've created it, that you can apply it to any of your microscopes that you sell if you're a big company. So you need a universal solution and you need a solution which isn't going to be difficult to operate and you need to do a solution which is simple and compact and so on and so on. Now here's the problem. Most of the development has gone on on the left-hand side and there has certainly been developments on the right hand side, but we haven't seen products coming out of it very much. And it's because there isn't an easy path between the new and these advanced methods we've been doing and the, the uh, what we might call the entry level solutions that people should be buying. Um, you know, what we should be doing if we want to get these things into microscopes is we want things which work the kind of things we were doing some time ago and not the really advanced stuff we've been doing more recently. So we need some different path of technical development, which allows us to get to those solutions so people can just go out and buy these things. And that's what we need to look at. So conclusion to this part, um, we're getting ever more advanced systems and they're being deployed to a wider range of applications, but they're mostly confined to research and development instruments. And it's difficult to go out and buy a full solution which you can plug and play. And the challenges here are not so much technical, but rather practical and commercial issues. I, I fully believe that had uh, a, a microscope company wanted to implement this 10 years ago, they could have done and could have, sold, could have sold it. The issue was not the technical aspect, it was whether or not they would make sense from a business point of view for them to do it. So let's move on and we'll come back to that a little bit later. So what's the future of adaptive optical microscopy? Well, here are some challenges I've identified. There's, there are many types of microscope, but we've still got no single adaptive optic solution. So we should try and address that challenge. Um, wavefront sensor systems can work in certain types of microscopes, but they're not a universal solution. Um, sensorless image-based indirect methods are widely applicable, but they do require careful specification and setup. And there's not everybody's uh, you know, inclination to try, and, to try and do that themselves. And of course, we want to keep pushing these things to become faster, we want them to go deeper, we want higher resolution. Um, all of these challenges are sort of the ones which we're already doing at the cutting edge of academic research. But the point at the bottom, the usability and translation between different microscopes is really what we need to be addressing if we're going to get this to be more broadly used and in a wider range of practical microscopes. But there are a few other challenges. Um, there are practical challenges, practical optical aspects. Uh, one thing is that to, in most situations, if you want to run adaptive optics reliably, then you need to make sure you're matching your pupil and objective lenses. You need, you need 4F systems, basically, in order to match the conjugate planes between, say, your deformable mirror and your objective lens. And the, this requires 4F relays to do it properly, to get correct imaging of the complex field and avoid uh, vignetting as much as possible. And this is challenging if you want to build compact systems. And I'll show you an example in a moment. The other one is that I mentioned before that there are different configurations of different microscopes. And that's one reason why we have different solutions. So for example, here's the configuration you would see if you had a two photon microscope where you only need to correct for aberrations in the illumination path because you're just collecting fluorescence in a bucket on the emission path. So you would place your adaptive element only in the excitation path. Um, if you, however, you were um, building a wide field type microscope or anything built around a wide field microscope, you would build it probably this way, where you put your adaptive element only in your emission path, because it's only the, the fidelity of imaging on that path which matters. Normally you're just flood illuminating the specimen, so it doesn't matter if there are aberrations in the illumination path. 
And then there are many other methods where we actually have aberrations introduced in both paths, the illumination and the emission, such as you would have in a confocal microscope. So we've got this issue that the configurations might be different for different systems. And we've got the issue that we need, although it's not shown in my cartoon schematic diagram here, we also need relay systems, 4F relay systems really, to, image, to make sure we've imaged the pupil planes properly. And the problem for that is illustrated in this microscope here. This is our structured illumination super resolution microscope called DeepSim. And uh, you know, we've, there's just examples on the left where you can see how we've used this to use our adaptive optics methods to improve the images here. Although that's not, this is not the main reason why I'm showing you this slide. The main reason why I'm showing you this slide is the actual picture of the setup on the table here. Um, you'll notice in the, the top left is where the microscope objective and stage are. You can't see the objective on this image, but it's be hidden behind the, the beam here. Bottom left, we have a deformable mirror to do pupil plane aberration correction. Top in the middle, we have a spatial light modulator, and this is to create the structured illumination patterns for the microscope. So we've got a focal plane SLM, a pupil plane deformable mirror, and various other things in there in order to calibrate this and so on as well, and lasers and detectors. But the important point here is that the reason why this table is so big and why most of the left left hand side of the table exists is because we need these re-imaging stages for the spatial light modulator and the deformable mirror. Wouldn't it be better if we could compact, compact these down <clears throat> and we didn't have to build them in this way? That would make a huge difference to the practicality of this as a product. <clears throat> another, another thing we've been working on is um, you know, can we come up with more universal methods for control in these microscopes? And so we've been coming up with this idea of a universal framework for image-based sensorless AO, where we should be able to uh, combine together all of these different methods, many of the ones we've shown, at least into the same framework, so they no longer look like different approaches. And we can actually compare them and work out which ones would be, would be uh, better than the others, in which situations, and which ones can complement each other. And so we've been developing this further and looking at how we take our image-based processes and um, look at how we represent the aberrations, how we optimize and the, uh, what, how we optimize the metrics and the estimation algorithms we use to do this. And so this is this method has allowed us to compare together different methods. These are three examples I showed you earlier, where uh, we have seemingly different ways of doing image-based <clears throat> adaptive optics um, optimization. But in fact, you can pull all these together and compare them and then work out that they're, they're, they are complementary and in fact, somewhat overlapping in the way we use them. And that's what we did in this paper here where we, where um, um, Chi, Chi Hu's work, where we actually um, com compared modal methods, pixelated methods and the segmented pupil methods to show that we can use them to do corrections. And some of them have a more advantageous in different application areas. <clears throat> Another thing we've done is, aside from looking at this representation of the aberrations, is look at how do we optimize this? How do we come up with metrics which allow us to, um, to optimize these things effectively? And in this paper here, which is led by uh, Jacopo Antonello, we, um, we looked at using wavelet decompositions of images as generalized feedback metrics, something which allows us to be a bit more generalized in the way we approach the optimization. And um, this enabled us to essentially do multi-scale optimization, which is applicable to, could be many microscopes. In this case, we applied it to STED microscopy, which is one area where this is a particular challenge. And we were able to use wavelet-based optimization to be able to optimize both at, at low resolution and high resolution scales in the same framework. And so by creating these, these generalizations, we're able to come up with something which hopefully will be more useful for people trying to specify their methods in the future. So getting towards the end now, the challenges commercial availability of these things, in my opinion, are there's a perceived difficulty of incorporation and operation. And I say perceived because there's some of us there who don't consider this as being difficult, but I think a lot of people do see that and we need to work on um, improving that. There's a cost in terms of hardware development and time, which could be, uh, could be an uh, off-putting to many people trying to develop this. Technical expertise may not be present in-house, whereas it's certainly present somewhere because people have been doing this, this type of work in research. And once you've got these, one, one of the challenges really for a commercial solution is that once you've got these things in place, you need long-term support and, uh, in order to make sure that this technology can be supported in the future. And ideally, we'd also do deal with these complex and bulky systems by shrinking them down to make them more effective. Now, this slide really is, is here in order to show you the things which we are now working on, the things we are working on from this point on in order to make this technology more accessible. And we'd be very pleased to hear from people who would like to work with us on this and find ways of working with us in order to get this 
whether that's on a commercial basis or on an academic research basis. And this is what we are doing now in our research. So conclude, the obstacles, in my opinion, to the future use of AO in a wide range of microscopes, not technical, but commercial. Um, we create more universal AO solutions. It will then help to aid wider deployment of this technology because people will have more versatile tools to use. Uh, by creating more accessible and integratable software and protocols and indeed longer term support, it will help reduce the barriers to adoption and creating more compact, simplified and affordable devices will increase the practicality of these AO systems. Now, one thing we've been doing already in order to uh, help out with this is start passing uh, information about protocols and assistance for people to guide on, on, on this website here, aomicroscopy.org. There's a whole range of hints and tips and tricks to uh, how to do this and, uh, and tutorials, and we'll be expanding that even further as time goes on. So people are welcome to please do go along there and take advantage of what we've provided. But also if you're interested in more advanced projects and working with us on these things, then do get in touch, uh, contact me, and I'll be happy to talk to you more about how we're working on creating these uh, solutions for commercial or for research applications in the future. So thank you very much. I'd be glad to take your questions. Wow, that was fantastic, Martin. This was also wonderful for people who are really interested in developing systems and I like your comment and kind of going through you know what are the problems and it's not always technical but as you said it's also the commercial world is kind of also interested in obviously adopting technology and sometimes that's not always I don't know I think it's also with confocal microscopy in my experience sometimes and hindrance because if commercially it becomes too competitive then it's not necessarily helping the science and vice versa so there's an interesting balance now I made actually a little quiz so I kind of I made a tiny quiz for everybody so i think this is for you <laughs> in the chat <laughs> just as a <laughs> sorry <laughs> it was just a cheeky one because we didn't have the mentimeter organized today <laughs> i'm gonna go back to the chat to read that now i think the answer, i think the answer to that first question are b c d and e but should yes. be a <laughs> yeah. Yeah, worldwide and A is, I guess, everywhere is almost the same. So I got it's well, a bit A's, tricky A's in chat. You can't it. actually have an virtual and kind of little. It's a bit tricky. <laughs> but thank you. I was very interested. So I don't know if people want to come forward. Are there people in the audience who would like to? Un there is there is usually... one question there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question is, I'd like to hear your thoughts on AO light sheet microscopy. Um, oh yeah, yeah sorry yeah that's good yeah. okay uh, well light sheets i mean i didn't yeah. show examples in here but people have of course demonstrated AO in light sheet microscopy and yeah i think it's one application where you're inherently using thick specimens and it suffers mm -hmm. from from aberrations um the, the biggest challenge is in a light sheet microscopy is just making sure your light sheet is coincident with your imaging plane that's your first challenge um there is an adaptive optics challenge um and then of course your imaging through uh, I mean, in general, the light sheets themselves are less affected. Uh, they can be affected, but they're less affected. The real challenge is imaging through the the, the light sheet onto the camera, where, of course, you'll see um, you will see aberrations because the light's propagating through the specimen there. Um, sometimes you'll face the challenges of spatially varying aberrations because, especially in light sheet, you tend to be looking at very large fields and across different sides of these. So. Um, there are, there are plenty of challenges for AO in light sheet microscopy, and some people have been dealing with those already, and I'm sure they will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. but there's also the light field imaging, which is obviously should be actually really interesting in con connection with the AO as well. Light, field light field's uh, interesting because inherently in light field microscopy, you're reducing the spatial resolution. So um, it's an interesting point about whether you really need adaptive optics with light field, because in light field, you can do some computational form of the adaptive optics as well. So, yeah, that's certainly that might be interesting to combine them. I mean, how much is like, I mean, AI imaging nowadays, when you look at Facebook AI um, projects, so it, um, um, I mean, this, yeah, Zuckerberg Foundation, there's a lot of computational um developments now where you kind of clear up images so that's kind of well i think the uh there's a clearly there's a clearly got application uh a lot of i mean the, let's 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 be let's realize that the 
vast majority of AI and machine learning and going on in microscopy, the vast majority of it is about post-processing of image data. Mm. That's okay, it's fully understandable why we do that, because that's where this is best suited to. But you still, in most situations, going to have to get the best data you can in order to use it. So you, you, know, you still need to be able to control your microscopes and get the, get the best images out of it. So, um, you know, we are using, uh, you know, there's, there's also other, you see some examples where people have done de-aberration of microscope images using this method. Well, that only works to a certain degree, because if you haven't required the necessary information in the first place, you can't then retrieve it using uh, ML, except for through certain situations where you have a lot of prior information. However, there is an application for um, using machine learning to help improve these uh, aberration sensing methods. And, you know, we're doing work in that area now. It's, uh, you know, it, we, we are looking at using machine learning. We are using machine learning as part of the control loop in order to improve those estimation. Because that's effectively what we're doing a lot of the time with, with this type of machine learning is actually uh, improved uh, estimation from data. And so we can use that from our, from our sequence of aberrated images in order to get better estimates of what the aberration correction should be. Then we do the aberration correction. Then we get the best images. Then we can pass it on to the other machine learning algorithms which people are using. Okay. Is that also part of the AO microscopy um, efforts? Will there be in the framework that's kind of... Yes, yeah, so, well, it will be. Yeah, super, very nice. Well, I have a question, if I, if I may interject. Yeah. Um, do you think that the motorized correction collar on an objective is a form of uh, adaptive optics? Because you know, basically nowadays you can get a sort of an optimization routine to run that as well. And that has a reasonable amount of impact in you know, sort of yeah. penetration into the market. No, sure. And once you once you connect that up to a feedback system, you know, you can do uh, it's essentially like it's like a it's like a deformable mirror with one mode of correction. You can think of it that way. So uh, certainly it make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, just to, I mean, we've, we've implemented this in the past. Other people have implemented this. Uh, you, you can, uh, there's a few small tricks you need to do about this just because of, so often you end up with focal plane shifting, but it's relatively simple to get around this. Um, and I'd strongly recommend people, if that's what you have access to, then do it. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting one. Um, I know some companies sell lenses with these collars on them. I don't know, maybe somebody can correct me. I haven't seen any, uh, potted routines they've used to actually um, do this, but you can implement your own versions of this quite straightforward. We've yeah. done this in our lab with a, with a Zeiss motorized objective lens. Now, there is a routine in the Nikon NIS elements for yeah. optimization. And um, I've also seen somewhere another a sort of 3D printed yeah. you know, unit that you can- Yeah, I think, I think many, pe many people have done it. We've certainly done it in Oxford. I don't think we ever published that because other people have done it as well, but you can do a 3D printed um, uh, uh, clip on motor effectively to control it, or you can buy these lenses from, I know Zeiss sells and maybe other people sell them as well, which have their built-in motors. Mm. Mm. Are there any more questions? Any other I have a question then. So yeah, sure. Is the, is the aperture of the deformable mirrors a, a, an issue here? Because I think they get quite expensive as they get bigger. Is that, is that correct? Well, there's a huge variety and they do come with different apertures and different strokes as in how far you can pull them and different numbers of actuators. Um, I would say, I mean, you, you can get some deformable mirrors down at the, you know, three or 4,000 euro level now. They're not necessarily good enough for the applications you might want to do in microscopy. I say not necessarily. I think they, they do have some applications. Um, you know, these are piezo driven deformable mirrors, which have, they need to be used carefully. Um, you know, from the mainstream suppliers, you can, you can get them in the region of, you know, what, 15 to 20,000 units, pounds, dollars, euros, uh, that kind of range. Um, as a sort of the, the ones I'd consider as being the lowest cost, but good enough quality versions. Uh, but then you can go up to, yeah, you can go up to hundreds of thousands if you wanted to. Um, yeah, I mean, I realise the, sort of the, the costing for, for an astronomical telescope is somewhat different to... Yeah, microscope. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there was one question as well about three photons. So the question was, is it possible to look deeper than using AI and 3P for getting deeper into tissues? I think you kind of already answered it, but maybe are there yeah, actually well, commercial systems who use this? Maybe that's the 
question from me. Um, would it work if we use adaptive optics in three photon? Well, yeah, we can use adaptive optics in three photon going through. People have been through skull. I'm not sure about skin. Uh, certainly going through brain tissue for, uh, you know, in neuroscience research, it's, it's actually becoming more common now. Uh, three photons quite becoming reasonably widespread now. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's one more question there. I think the most expensive part is the, the laser, no? For yeah. the multi-photon imaging. I mean, that's, that's, that's still true. not particularly come down. Mm. Um, and then there's one more now coming in, the magnitude of aberration that AI AO can correct. Well, that's a very that's a very difficult question because various different ways of, um, you know, you can, for example, say how far a deformable mirror can displace and therefore what size of aberrations it can correct. But um, there's other aspects there to do with complexity of the aberrations, you know, how many, how many um, actuators do you need? Um, so what I would say is that in, there are so many different, although I've mentioned there's so many different types of microscopes, but of course, there are also so many different types of applications for each of those microscopes. Mm. And even if you were only, only interested in, say, one particular type of tissue, brain, mouse brain tissue, let's say, then different experiments you do may suffer very much from different aberrations. And so it's very difficult to come up with a simple answer to that. For a particular deformable mirror in a particular microscope, you can work out how deep you can focus. Um, you know, if you're for a particular type of, um, of application, you might be able to get some idea of this, but it's, um, all I would say is that people have done demonstrations where you, uh, it also depends on how sensitive the microscope is. So for example, doing three photon microscopy to go one millimeter inside tissue, Yes, you can do that with a relatively standard deformable mirror. Um, if, however, you wanted to go even a few micrometers into a cell-based specimen in super-resolution microscopy, then you may find out that that's a serious aberration and needs, needs a careful correction. So it really is a huge range. It's very difficult to give a general correct answer to that kind of question. Is there anybody in the actual audience who's got their hand up? I can't see the right thing. But I think people, uh, there were lots of uh, exciting comments. So. And also, I guess from my point, also in the question, so if you wanted to test the system for your own purposes, I mean, there are commercial systems available. So testing some of the, you know, people, well, because this was here, can I, how can I know that AAO can work for us? I mean, that's something you can test with some commercial systems. Not so easily, I think is the answer to that. Um, in a way, the easy part of this, I would say, is buying an adaptive or buying or borrowing an adaptive optics mirror, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, but the difficulty then comes is how do you integrate two things? One is how would you control it? Because you need to you know, understand how to actually control this thing properly in order to use it effectively. The other one is about integration. How do you integrate this into your system? And this applies to commercial systems as much as just to research systems, or it's slightly easier if you can tinker with your own software to do this. Um, and uh, because adaptive optics can't really exist on its own. It's always part of another system. So it's got to be embedded in that system. And so you have to, that usually means you have to have at least some form of connection, some kind of embedding in your software. And this is one thing we're working on at the moment mm -hmm. is how do we create those software packages in such a way that we can give people instructions which are not too onerous to say, this is how you get our software mm -hmm. working in your microscope. Even though we don't know what your microscope is yet, follow these instructions, we can get this working. Yeah. And that's that's one of the that's one of the biggest hindrances, I think, at the moment is it's difficult to do this in a plug and play way, even if you're in a research lab and you have to sort of develop your own suite, if you like to do this. And this is not satisfactory from a community point of view. And so that's why we're trying to solve this, solve this problem so that people don't have to become experts in adaptive optics in order to use adaptive optics as part of their microscope. Mm. It's great, really, really exciting, actually. I mean, it's really, you're a brave person, brave man. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. It's, it's really, if anyone has any more. Well, there's one more we should, what do you think about perspectives of advanced imaging center? Janelia Research Campus approach to bridge between academic research and the rest of us. Um, I think we need things like the, the AIC. Um, I, I mean, the AIC has been around for a while, so I think the community can answer that, that question. I don't need to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
-hmm. Well, if there are no other questions, I think we're now just uh, five minutes over time. Then can we just thank uh, Martin? Thank well, Martin. It was wonderful because also all the kind of how we scientists work with commercial um, companies and your thoughts on that. I mean, I think that's very special to to have demonstrated it in such a really insightful and creative and positive actually way. So I thank you very much. This was great. Fantastic. Thank you.